Good morning. Welcome to First Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. We're so glad that you have joined us today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So we want you right there where you are to just join us in spirit. Join us as we worship together. Join us as we pray together. And then I'm going to give you the word that the Lord has laid upon my heart for today. So right now, let's just go right into worship. There's a blessed time that's coming, coming soon. Well, it may be evening, morning, or at noon. There'll be Thank you. 
never let go of your love, Son. Praise you, Jesus. But we know, oh God, there's going to come a day, Lord, when all our troubles will be over. And we'll be so glad, dear Lord, that we have entered to the gates of heaven. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the day that will come when we can see your face. Hallelujah. We just want to be blessed today, oh God. Have to enter into your presence. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. It's prayer time in our service, and we're so glad to know today that God answers prayer. In fact, I would like to just share with you a wonderful praise report. We have been praying now for several weeks for Reverend Greg Mundus, who is the executive director for World Missions for the Assemblies of God. He had been transferred out of the hospital in Springfield up into uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, had been gravely ill. This week he has been brought back to Springfield, which means he has made an extreme turnaround and doing wonderfully well. He's not completely well yet, but thank God for the progress that he has made. And we just want to continue to pray for him today. So as we pray, we're going to pray for you and for your household and your needs today. So let's just join together in prayer right here. Father, we come today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts because of the goodness of God, the faithfulness of our God. Lord, you've never failed us in any way. Lord, we thank you for the good report that we've received about Brother Mundus. We rejoice, Lord, that your healing hand has been upon him. We're thankful for what you did for Brother Ron Maddox. In fact, I was able to see him this week. And Lord, I, it was so good to see that he's functioning so well. Lord, I just pray that you will continue to keep him well. And others that have been affected by this virus. We pray, Lord, your healing hand upon them today. And now, Father, I just pray for our church family it seems like it's been a forever since we've been able to get together here in the sanctuary. And we have probably become weary somewhat in wondering when is all of this going to be behind us. But Lord, we just pray that you will minister to every home and every family. Lord, I pray for every individual today for the touch of God to be upon their lives. And that one today that is needing healing, I pray your healing touch upon them now. From the top of their head to the soles of their feet, may they be made well and whole in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for doing it. And we give you all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise. Amen and amen. Now, this morning, we want to take just a few moments to let you know that if you are reading through the Bible with us this year, we are coming near to the end of the month of April. We have the May schedule ready in the office if you would like to receive a schedule of Bible reading so you can keep on track just get in touch with us at the office. And may I remind you, the office hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8.30 till noon. Also, let me just remind you as well, while we're talking about that, if you have your offering, your tithe, you're ready to give, then come by the office and drop it by or put it in the mail and mail it to the church address. Or you can go online and give to PensacolaFirst.com or you can text your gift to 84321. And I just want to say thank you so much to all of our people. Thank you for being so faithful in giving, especially since we're not here together and it's a little more difficult than dropping an 
envelope into the offering bag. We want to thank you for going to the extra effort that you're making to get your offerings in. God bless you richly. We appreciate it so very much. Now I'd like to get right into the word of the Lord with you this morning and I feel like that I have a word from God for us. So I want you to get your Bibles and let's get ready for the word. And the title of my message today is The Promise of His Coming. I'm taking you to 2 Peter chapter 3 and we're going to begin reading with verse number 3. And we will read through verse 13. Now we will come back and look at those verses as we go through the message this morning. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water." But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in, in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This begins by saying, in the last days, scoffers will come. I believe this morning that all of us can agree that we are living in the last days. I don't have to go through all of the scriptures that are there that talk about the last days and how we are certainly in the midst of it, but I am reminded of 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1 that says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. I think we're living in perilous times today. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. In this time, that we are living, there are those who are scoffing at the idea that Jesus Christ will ever come back to the earth again. The first time I ever heard someone say that out loud in my presence was actually a minister, not a Pentecostal minister, not an Assemblies of God pastor, but he was a pastor. 
And I heard him say that he did not believe that Jesus Christ would ever come back to the earth again. But as we continued to discuss, I found out that there was many other things of the scriptures that he didn't believe. But I want to remind you this morning that God is faithful to his promises. He has never failed once. His promises are true. And in the last days, there are those who are coming and saying, things have continued to be as they have always been. Where is the promise of his coming? But the scripture says they willingly forget some very important facts. They forget about the flood that came in Noah's day. The flood that came as judgment against sin. In the chapter just prior to the one that I began with this morning, in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, in verse 4, we find these words. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly. Listen to that. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly. He delivered Noah. He delivered Lot. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority and so forth. And you can continue to read if you would like. But now back to our text in 2 Peter chapter 3. I'd like to look at verse number 7 that says, But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word. The word of God is what brought the heavens and the earth into being. It is the same word of God that is preserving the world today. But it is being reserved for fire. Because God had said to Noah that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. This time it will be by fire. Look at the next verse. Verse number 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now I would like to just take a moment and say to you, as you're interpreting Scripture... And you come through the scriptures and you find a day. Don't necessarily interpret that to mean a thousand years. And when you find a thousand years, don't just say, well, that means one day. I believe what the Lord was saying here is that God sees time all in one span. And there is no difference for him to see a thousand years as it is for him to see one day. He can pick out any one day and see that day. In fact, he sees and knows the day we're living in right now today. But he also sees the span of time that we're living in. We wonder why that the Lord continues to allow the things to go on as they are going. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He is not 
unfaithful to his word, but rather he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You wonder how things are continuing the way they are today when we see the wickedness that's all around us. Why would God continue to put up with what's going on around us? God is long-suffering. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish. He is reaching out to the lost. And this morning, I want to bring this point right down to us. He is looking to us to use the time that we have left to reach out to those who are around us who are not ready to meet the Lord, who are not ready to go when Jesus comes back. So we need to be winning souls to the Lord. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But before the day of the Lord comes and that day when all the things that we see will be dissolved and all the heavens and the earth will be on fire, Jesus is coming to take his church to heaven. I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming, and he's coming very soon. I remember that the disciples in Matthew chapter 24 asked Jesus, when will these things happen? And Jesus went right through a whole uh, list of things that would happen. And in fact, the first things he said, these are the beginning of trouble. This is the beginning. The end is not yet. But then he brings it right on down. But I'm not dealing with Matthew chapter 24 this morning. Rather, I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a favorite passage of mine. Listen very carefully. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, if he doesn't want us to be ignorant, what does he want us to be? He wants us to be knowledgeable. He wants us to have an understanding. So he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, when he's talking about falling asleep, he's talking about those who have died, those who have passed from this life. They have fallen asleep. They're asleep in Jesus. And so he says, I don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope. That does not mean that we can't sorrow when, a, when we lose a loved one. We have grief because we know that they're no longer with us in this world. But he says, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. When we have sorrow, when we have grief, we have it with hope. There is a hope within us today. It's the blessed hope of the church. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. He says, those who are asleep, the Lord is going to bring them with him. So if the Lord is going to bring them with him, they are there with him now. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when the Lord comes in the clouds of glory, it is going to be a wonderful time when we are going to be able to be joined together with our loved ones. We're going to be joined together with those who've gone before us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Lord is coming. When He comes, those who have died, He's bringing with Him. But He's coming for those who are still remaining, but those who have died and they are coming with Him are coming back for a purpose. They are going to receive a new, resurrected, glorified body. I want to turn with you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse number 50. And Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All of us are not going to die. Some of us may still be here alive when Jesus comes back again. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We're going to receive a glorified, resurrected body that we will have forever and ever, and we're going to rise to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. What I want to bring down to us this morning is this. While all the things that are going on around us may be causing men to be fearful, let not the church be fearful, for there is a wonderful hope that we have in Christ. God has it all under control. God knows the end from the beginning. He has not been caught off guard by anything that's happening around us today. He knew the end from the beginning. He knew all of these things that would be coming to pass. So this morning, we must trust Him. Have your faith in Him because He's coming back for a prepared people. We need to prepare ourselves, get ready for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming. I want you to keep that in focus, in your mind, in this week ahead of us. Jesus is coming. I remember as a little boy, I used to hear preachers preach about the coming of the Lord so often that uh, I would just expect Jesus to come every day. I would go out and look up in the sky and I would think, oh, Jesus may come today. I'd love to see him coming today. I've walked out under the stars at night, looked up into the sky and thought, oh, this would be a wonderful time that Jesus could come back. I remember when we were having a Christmas celebration with Trigg's family several years ago. She had an aunt that was there with us, and uh, she lived downtown in Panama City. They asked me to take her home as uh, the party was over. And we got in the car and got in a discussion. And now I understand she was an older woman. And she said to me, David, I've been hearing all my life that Jesus is coming. Do you really think he's ever going to come back again? Do you really believe that? She says, I, I've come to the place I'm not sure. And I said to her, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming. I've lived all my life looking for him to come. And you may say, well, that's been a long time that you've been looking up in the sky. It's been a long time that you've been expecting him to come. Well, let me tell you today, 
we're closer than we've ever been before. So when I was a young boy, I thought, surely Jesus is going to come and take us away. But it didn't happen. Now, I have to be honest with you. There was a time when I said to the Lord, Lord, please don't come until I could get married. Because I want to get married and have a family. Lord, please don't come. You know what? He was faithful to that. I don't know that that had anything to do with him not coming at the time. Most likely not because he is going to come on the timetable of God. Now, if anybody comes around and tells you that they know when Jesus is coming, don't believe them. We were living in the Cincinnati area back in the late 70s. And I remember hearing a man preach on the radio and he had a revelation from God that God had told him that Jesus was coming that year in 1979. He was coming on April the 1st. Guess what? It didn't happen. Well, you know what April the 1st is. Well, he proved to be that exactly. Don't try to figure out the day or the hour. Because the Bible tells us no man knows the day nor the hour. We can look and see the signs of the times and see that the day is approaching. There are those who have written books. They're just so sure that they know who the Antichrist is going to be. They're so sure that they have all it, everything figured out in prophecy. Several years ago, I heard people saying, you know, that uh, Hitler was supposed to have been the Antichrist. Surely he's going to come back as the Antichrist. I don't think so. And then there were those who were taking numbers and taking people's names and assigning a number to each letter in the name and adding it up and figuring it out. And it would come out to be, you know, if you multiplied it by this and added this and divided it by this, it would come out to 666, the mark of the beast. Don't be carried away with all those kinds of things. Don't get into the tangents, but rather keep your heart and mind open with a great expectation that one day and one day soon, Jesus Christ is going to break through the skies and he's coming back for his church. And we need to be ready. Now, as I close this message this morning, I want to bring you to the last chapter in the book. You've often heard people say, I've read the last chapter page in the book, and we win. Well, I want to take you to Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read verse 7, first of all. I like to read all those words that are in red in my Bible. Verse 7 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Then verses 12 and 13, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then I want to call attention to verse number 20. Next to the last verse in the Bible. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And then these words, which are not in red, and I believe is the response, not only of John, but is the response of the church today that says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? If he were to come today, would you be ready to meet him? You'd say, well, you know, I'm not so bad. I, I've been pretty good. That's not going to get it. Well, you know, I try to do what's right. I go to church. Going to church is not going to get it. 
In fact, if it was dependent on going to church, you're in bad shape right now. You can't get into church. It's not about that. It's about coming to the place that you say to the Lord, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I receive you now by faith. If you'll pray that prayer this morning and you mean it from your heart, the Lord will hear you. He will answer. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he wants to draw you to himself. Let me pray for you before I go. Father, I pray for each one today who has joined with us. And I pray, Lord, especially for that one today who does not have the assurance that if Jesus were to come, that they would be ready to meet you, Lord. Lord, I pray that they can have peace in their heart by simply calling upon you and receiving you as their Lord and Savior. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.